For this section, we're going to talk about creating automation. So this could be a persona within your organization, the automation creator, or it could be anyone who's creating automation and looking at it on the command line. We're going to be covering Ansible Core, which acts as kind of the bridge between the upstream community and the downstream product, which is the Ansible automation platform. So when you pip install Ansible and get the community version, you're getting the same Ansible Core you would with the downstream product with a bunch of community packages. We're going to talk about Playbook Basics. We're going to talk about a new technology called Execution Environments. And finally, a new command line tool included in your Red Hat subscription called Ansible Navigator. So what is Ansible Core? I mentioned it before. It is the underlying command line tool and framework that underlies all Ansible automation. It's been called Ansible Base in the past, and before it was just Ansible. But Ansible Core is referring to just the CLI, the language, the framework, and the functions that make up Ansible. So why is Ansible Core important? Ansible Core is kind of the focal point between the upstream community with Ansible project and the downstream Red Hat Ansible automation platform product. So when you run Ansible Playbook, you are running Ansible Core under the hood. And when you run Ansible Automation Platform, you're interacting with Core just the same to execute playbooks. The difference happens is that the community project is command line only. There's a variety of different projects with the Ansible Automation Platform. And all the product components are open source. But what you're mostly seeing in the upstream community is just Ansible Core plus the collections. And we're going to cover all the enterprise components of Red Hat Ansible Automation Platform, and we bundle that together into a feature-rich project or product. So that's the difference between the platform, the product, and the upstream community. Before we kind of deep dive, I want to kind of zoom out and just show kind of a Hello World Ansible playbook. Chances are you've probably seen this one on our website or an ebook or something really similar, but this is just how simple a playbook is. I think anyone who's ever worked on a Linux system could look at this and kind of take away what's happening here. It's running on a host named web. Uh, become must be some sort of privilege escalation, which we'll kind of talk about later. And then this task has, or this playbook has three tasks. It's going to install HTTPD. It's going to template something, which we'll get into. And then it's going to turn on the HTTPD service on this machine. And this is why Ansible is so simple and so powerful is that not only is it really easy to understand, is that just in a few lines of YAML, we can install web servers on who knows how many web servers, right? We haven't taught groups and, and nodes yet, but this is, could be one web server, it could be many more. And the real power here is it's self-documenting, meaning that when someone looks at your playbook, it's not like reading Python code or their C code or a bash script, is that it's very easy. It does this, then it does this, then it does that. It's very simple to understand the playbook. So what makes up a playbook? We have plays, we have modules, and we have plugins. And these are the components of a playbook. And we'll kind of dive in and show what they are on that example we just showed. So a playbook can actually have multiple plays. The play stanza was at the top. It said install and start Apache. It told us what host it was on. This could be a host named web, or it could actually be a group of web servers that we could, we could run on simultaneously in parallel. And finally, we can put our privilege escalation also here. So become yes is allowing us to be like pseudo into those boxes by default. Modules. So each task is a one-to-one -one, um, correlation with the module. So when we look at those tasks, for example, this one is the template task. It is using the template module. Um, I think the other thing to mention here is most of the modules are written in Python. Ansible Core is actually written in a way that they don't have to be Python. It just happens to be that Ansible Core is written in Python, so most of the modules are also written in Python. And there's an example with this is for the Windows automation, we actually use PowerShell. So when you look at the modules for Windows, they're actually PowerShell modules, and they actually execute on those Windows boxes in PowerShell. Plugins. 
So plugins, look, technically, I like to back up. Technically, modules are plugins. We kind of, they're, they're kind of a major difference is they're, they're the task executed. Plugins are kind of all the extra bits that allow us to, to change the behavior or do interesting bits of code outside of Ansible. So there's a ton of different types of them. And I think the most common are gonna be kind of the become here is technically a plugin for privilege escalation. And it can be done on a play level or it could be done on a module level. There's also a bunch of like filter plugins. Filter plugins allow us to change the variable output of a particular task into JSON, YAML. You can actually even change it into CSV. If for some reason you just love using Google Sheets or Excel, you can, you can take that data and shove it into a CSV. And there's a ton of different extensible plugins that you can use with Ansible. So one of the questions I get a lot is like, I like using Python or whatever programming language of their choice. And what they're missing is that kind of whoosh moment is that you can use code that you write as a plugin and then plug it into Ansible. So you take advantage of all the other things Ansible does really well, even if you prefer doing a super, uh, particular function or a piece of code um, your own way. So inventory. So when we said web before, you can see that that's a group. So when we have colon web and uh, sorry bracket web end bracket, we actually have two web servers here: web server one dot example dot com and web server two. We actually have three groups here: there's web, DB, and switches. Is we can now have an inventory that multiple playbooks are hitting, and you can tell that particular playbook to run only on a particular piece of the inventory. So the playbook we just showed was only running on the web servers, where it might not make sense. If those switches are a Cisco iOS device, we obviously don't want to install HTTPD to a Cisco switch. So roles, I mentioned this before, um, we can store them in a collection, but roles are reusable playbooks basically that are written in a way where we can group it in a reusable structure. So when we have that playbook before, we could create a web server role that now anyone, instead of having to cut and paste three tasks, they could just say roles, web servers, and then that configures the web servers for them. So you'll see this kind of happen is when you have more than three or four tasks in a row that are always being used the same way, it becomes a good candidate to become a role. And you'll see on uh, a lot of projects, I'm just thinking of examples in my head. So I like workshops projects we build, I think has like 15 plus roles where it does a role to set up uh, the control node. It does a role to set up uh, the hosted nodes. It does a role to create a little website for people to log in. You can kind of daisy chain all these roles together and you can have multiple plays in a playbook. So they're just reusable pieces of code. So collections, this is how we share content for Ansible and that includes roles. So a collection can have one or more roles within it. Previously, Multiple years ago, the only way you could share content was one role per Git repo or GitHub specifically. So collections kind of change the paradigm as it creates a tarball where we can put multiple roles in there and playbooks and plugins and docs and tests. And it's basically a file structure that we all agreed to in the community to create content. So for example, there's a Cisco iOS collection. There's an Arista EOS collection. There's a NetApp collection. There's a collection for all the vendors you know and love, and I'll show Automation Hub later. You can also create collections within your own organization. So I have like a network toolkit collection that I created where it's specifically only roles and playbooks dealing with network devices. The collections is that standard unit of automation. And the reason collections exist is so that we can work asynchronously than the Ansible automation platform release. So for example, if a new module or feature comes out in the old days of Ansible, you'd have to install the newest version of Ansible. Um, now it's just like the app and on your phone is I don't update the calculator or Facebook app on my phone um, by updating my phone. I just update the apps, right? So collections are just kind of that, it, they make sense. It's how we distribute content and you can update them asynchronously from the releases of the Ansible automation platform. So again, we're gonna show some code in this, in this fact it's YAML, so, so don't freak out too much, but we're just showing a particular collection. So this is a deploy NGINX collection, and you can see that's a collection 
by the folder structure here. So it'd be hard for you to know unless you would already memorized the file structure, which I'm not expecting any of you to, is it has a folder for playbooks. It has a folder for plugins and it has a folder for roles. And when I include the role, I can run different roles that are within there. And this playbook is in here as being displayed. So when we run the playbook, it includes multiple roles. And then these roles can be deployed in the single collection, meaning I could hand this collection to someone on my team and they can take that collection and run and roll. And that collection may have dependencies on other collections and there's a requirements file in there and it will install those as well if it needs it. There's over, it says 90 certified platforms. I think there's actually over 100 as of today and that number keeps growing. Uh, certified specifically means that there is a hand to shake or a throat to choke, depending on the, the term you wanna use. I like to be more positive, but it means that as part of your Red Hat subscription, you know it's fully supported. We have contracts with these partners and sign the T's and C's that you know this is the official collection. There are community upstream collections, and this is a way to differentiate between what's fully supported by that particular vendor or Red Hat and what's just community and someone's creating a proof of concept or a demo. And these certified platforms and certified vendors are all found on console.redhat.com as part of your Red Hat subscription. So now that you understand what a collection is, I kind of want to talk about a new paradigm shift that's happened. We have tons of different collections as we talked about. I think we have over a hundred different collections dozens and dozens of partners that are certified. Plus you'll have your own collections that you build and distribute within your organization. Each collection may have different dependencies. These could be Python dependencies or system level libraries, and they might require different versions of Ansible. So to solve this problem, we've introduced a new technology called Automation Execution Environments, or EEs for short, as you'll see some of the Ansible engineers refer to them. These are components where we take all of these requirements to execute automation, the collections you need to, to run, the playbooks you want to run in those collections, the libraries you need, whether that's some sort of Python dependency, an API, an SDK, and you tie this with the Ansible core version that you want to use, and this is on a universal base image. We package this into an execution environment, and these are available on registry.redhat.io as part of your Red Hat subscription. These are completely bundled within the Ansible automation platform. And we, by default, give these execution environments. There's no requirement to build them where you get all the supported content in one execution environment out of the box. However, we also supply a minimal execution environment that you can build on top of. So if you have certified content from a partner plus your own content, you can bundle that together in an execution environment and put it together. This is leveraging container technology, but we only use Ansible tooling and we fully support it. So there's no need to understand container technology or be a container or Kubernetes expert. We bundle this all within the platform and make it really easy to use. This basically deprecates Python virtual environments and having to re-replicate those in different environments. Now, if I build an execution environment and share this with another person on my team, they can get up and started much quicker than having to replicate all the same requirements that I had on my control node into their control node, mimicking the Ansible core version and so on and so forth. This content creator can use another command line tool that we're not gonna cover today. It's a little bit more advanced. It's not hard, but it's just not covered because it's a different persona because we bundle these execution environments, but it's called execution environment builder or Ansible builder for short. This builder command will basically bundle these all up together and then create an execution environment, which you can then publish to your private automation hub. We will elaborate on private automation hub later in this presentation, but private automation hub is basically a local self-hosted or on-premises solution for hosting execution environments and or collections. Finally, the content creator can run execution environments using a new command line tool called Automation Content Navigator. The actual command line command is ansible-navigator, and I'll showcase that on the command line in a little bit. This command is very similar, similar to Ansible playbook commands if you're used to open source Ansible. 
However, it has a lot of enhanced features, including simply the ability to run execution environments. So instead of just running locally on that Ansible execution on your, on your Linux machine, on your control node, this will run on the specified execution environment for your um, development environment. Now, what this really helps with too, is as you operationalize execution or your automation rather, and you go from the developer stage, and then you wanna put it into automation controller, previously known as Tower, this allows a much more seamless experience because you don't have to replicate those requirements even from going from command line Ansible up to automation controller or different sites. So if you have a different Ansible automation platform in Japan, in Korea, and so on and so forth, it becomes really easy to replicate the automation because you're packaging it all together. You're not just handing them a playbook and then they have to figure out all the requirements to run that playbook. So we will cover Automation Content Navigator and it has a new cool interactive mode that allows you to kind of zoom into plays and zoom out. And I'll also showcase that today. Another thing we like to mention in the kind of getting started part is how Ansible Automation works. And it's a little bit different depending on what we're automating. So when we're automating API endpoints like the AWS Bot03 uh, API or network devices like the Cisco IOS where it's just a command line, we actually execute that automation locally where we run these in parallel processes on the control node and to get more execution capacity, Ansible Automation Platform can actually be installed as a cluster and you'll actually be able to spread out compute power if that becomes a problem. Now, I think it scales very well. My own laptop, I can do probably a couple hundred routers before it starts singing. So it does scale. I think that's always a question I get. It does really well. And we have a platform solution for scaling this up to the tens of thousands. When we execute this for Linux or Windows hosts, they actually have the ability to execute code. So we can scale this even further because that code is actually executed on the end system. So on the rel nodes that I'll be showing today, that Ansible automation is actually copying over that module code. It will execute it on that Linux device, a Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 device that I have set up. Then it will send back basically a JSON blob saying like what it did before and after, was it successful? And then it kind of deletes itself off the system. So we're agentless as we piggyback on SSH, but we do execute when we can on those remote systems to help scale even farther. Now that you have an overview of Ansible and how it works, let's get into some Ansible basics.